I'm really pleased to be a United Methodist. It has been part of my whole life and it has allowed me the opportunity to be part of a large family, a connected family around the world. I actually grew up in one of the other many beautiful variations and expressions of Christian faith. And then I began to learn a little bit more about the founding of this denomination. And so there's continual thread of openness to diversity, diverse ways of worship, of understanding, space for different opinions. As I was growing up, I was really encouraged to ask questions. The United Methodist Church helped to make my faith whole and, and to, to know who I am, what I believe in, and why I believe it. I grew up a member of the Methodist and United Methodist Church, and our mission statement is making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I love the fact that we do a lot with missions in our local church, supporting, uh, feeding people who are hungry in our community. It allows me opportunities to be in service, not only in my community, but in the broader conference. We have the general board of the United Methodist Committee on Relief, sending people out in disaster areas to help. And we always have a reputation of being some of the first ones on scene and some of the last to leave. We have Mission U, which is what the United Women of Faith do, the Solar Oven Partners, which is a wonderful organization that I've participated in in many different ways, even gone on overseas with them. It truly feels like home. It's a place to belong. We're all human. <laughs> and sometimes we make mistakes. And we all need that grace and forgiveness from each other. I appreciate John Wesley's motto about doing. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the places you can, with all the people you can, as long as ever you can. I really treasured the books that Reuben Job wrote on Wesley's ideas of three simple rules. Do good do no harm, and stay in love with God. There were always people around to help, um, whether they were pastors, teachers, youth workers, um, just other friends and, and camp leaders and youth and things like that, who were, who were there to, to bounce questions off of and explore these, these kind of topics together. We are united in our worship of Christ. We are united in the grace that has come to us through Jesus. And so for me, the United Methodist denomination is where I feel at home. It's part of the reason why I'm really proud to be a member of the Dakota's Conference of the United Methodist Church because we put our faith into practice. I'm proud to be. I am proud to be. I am proud to be. Dakota's UMC. Dakota's UMC. I'm proud to be Dakota's UMC. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Worship with Canyon Lake United Methodist Church. Canyon Lake is located on the far western edge of South Dakota in beautiful downtown Rapid City. And today we want to tell you that we're going to be doing some experimenting inside of our online worship to see how we can improve it. And so what you're going to notice if you're watching is, first of all, in this recording, we are going to be making it shorter and we're going to be making it more intimate. And then we also, at the same time, are going to be offering a live stream version so that if you want to see the entire worship service in our sanctuary, you can do that. We would love to hear your opinion on this. What works for you? How can we improve it? We're constantly experimenting to find out what is it that, that works. If you would like to give us some of your opinions, we would love to invite you to go in on our website, clumc.com. Be careful if you Google this, because it turns out that there are two other Canyon Lake United Methodists, one in Texas and one in California. And it's super easy to, to get us all mixed up. We laugh whenever we get messages that are meant for them. So let's, let's see where we go. Would you bow with me? Let's pray. Lord, I want to give you thanks for your blessing, your guidance, your presence in our lives, and simply ask that you would be the one now that guides us in this time. Open our minds, open our hearts, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, hi, hello, Canyon Lake. We are so glad that you've decided to join us in worship today. Today, we're talking again about the lowly. We've talked about 
how women were some of the lowly, uh, sick people. Today we're talking about a tax collector. Do you know what taxes are? It's like money. So kiddos, if you get an allowance, you would have to give some of that allowance to the government or to the, maybe the king of your land to help them pay the things that they needed to pay off. Well, there were people that were tax collectors and they were the ones in charge of going and collecting those taxes. And as you would imagine, they were not very popular people. Note, tax collectors were very hated because honestly, they weren't very honest. Some things they would take more money than the king wanted them to and they would take the extra. So would it surprise you to know that Jesus met one of these tax collectors? Probably not. Let me tell you the wonderful story of Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus was a short man and he was a tax collector. And like I said, he did not have many friends at all. Zacchaeus was hated because he was dishonest and took people's money more than he was supposed to. When Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming to town, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. But as you imagine, everybody wanted to see Jesus. And since Zacchaeus was so short, he had to climb up a tree to see Jesus. Now, as Jesus was walking down the street, he looked up in the tree and he saw Zacchaeus. And Jesus called out, Zacchaeus, climb down, for I am coming to your house today. Zacchaeus could believe his ears. He jumped down and ran home to get ready. But then somebody in the crowd said, the man is a liar and a cheat. Why would you want to go to his house? Zacchaeus heard these people saying bad things about him and it made him feel very bad. And at that moment, Zacchaeus was changed. Zacchaeus served Jesus a meal and then he decided that he would take the money that he had cheated people and give it back to the people. Zacchaeus said, Lord, I will give half of everything I owe to the poor and everyone I have cheated. I will give it back to them four times the amount that I stole. Jesus smiled. Zacchaeus, he said, today you have become a new man. So here we again have another story of Jesus making friends and paying attention to the people that needed his help. Are you taking care of those people too? Are you paying attention to the people that need your attention the most? Go forth this week and be kind and show everybody God's love. Now I'm going to turn it over to Scott for today's message. All the way through Lent, we continue to be walking into Adam Hamilton's book, Luke, as we explore what the Gospel of Luke is all about, where it guides our lives. Today, we're going to be hearing two different, uh, two, two different passages from Luke, one in Luke 19 and one in Luke 20. I want to invite you to get your Bible and listen also. All right, here we go. Luke 19. This is the story of Zacchaeus. It begins in the first chapter. Jesus entered, Jeru entered Jericho and was passing through town. A man there named Zacchaeus, a ruler among tax collectors, was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree so that he could see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to that spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down at once. I must stay in your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once, happy to welcome Jesus. Everyone who saw this grumbled, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone, I will repay them four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household, because he too is a son of Abraham. The human one came to seek and save the lost. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this God's Word. I want to invite you into prayer. And I love to invite you into prayer where you are at. And so in just a moment, what I would do is invite you to pause this. Whoever you are with, 
a spouse, family, friends, just stop and ask each other, what do you need prayer for this week? And then pray for each other. You can pray for the person on the right, the person across from you. You can all pray in silence. One person can do all the praying. It doesn't matter. It's whatever is most comfortable for you. Are you ready? Go ahead and pause. Welcome back. <laughs> Let's bow. Let's pray together. Gracious God, I want to give you thanks always and ever that with deep, deep gratitude, give you thanks for all that you have given. For Lord, we live this life that we don't even recognize how blessed we are. We give you thanks for the roof over our head, for the food that is on our table, for the heat that is just there, for water that we don't question if it's healthy or not. Lord, all these things, we give you thanks, knowing that there are millions and sometimes billions of people in the on the face of the earth who do not have these. Lord, we give you thanks for friendship, for family, for love and life and laughter. Today, Lord, I lift up all of those who are facing surgery and simply pray your guidance, your blessing, and your healing upon them. Lord, I pray for those who are dealing with death and dying in their families and ask that you would guide them through this time into the grieving process and into that time that is so incredibly precious of letting go and saying goodbye. So, Lord, we give you thanks for new babies, for those who are bringing new life into this world. We ask and pray that we would have the wisdom, not just as their parents or grandparents, but, Lord, as the church surrounding them, to give them the wisdom, the experience that it takes for them to grow into their full lives. And so, Lord, we pray for our churches, this Canyon Lake Church and whatever other churches are out there that, that we are participating in. Gracious and heavenly God, we ask your blessing. May it be that your hand in our lives means that our hand can be helping others. We ask. Lord, move and work through us. All of this, in Jesus' name, amen. Join me in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The second reading that we have today is coming from Luke chapter 20. Just one more, one more page over. And this is all about an attempt to trap Jesus. Now, all of this is happening in the final week of Jesus' life. He has dropped down from Galilee, past Samaria, down into Judea, into Jerusalem, and is now being confronted at every step of the way. Here we go, starting in verse 20, in chapter 20. The legal experts and chief priests were watching Jesus closely and sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They wanted to trap Jesus in his words so that they could hand him over to the jur jurisdiction and the authority of the governor. They asked him, Teacher, we know that you are correct in what you say and teach. You don't show favoritism, but teach God's way as it really is. Does the law allow people to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Since Jesus recognized their deception, he said, Show me a coin. Whose image and inscription does it have on it? They replied, Caesar's. So Jesus said to them, Then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. They couldn't trap him in his words in front of the people. And astonished by his answer, they were speechless. As we prepare for the message, would you go ahead and bow with me for just a moment of silence? Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but what 
was Jesus doing? You know, he could have lived to be a very old man if he had just stayed in the north up in Galilee, that's where he did the vast majority of his ministry. If he had just stayed there and let things be, he could have lived past the three years that he did. He could have lived another 30 years, but no, no. What was he doing? Jesus was there to poke the bear. He understood very, very well what was happening inside of Israel, up in Galilee, down in Samaria, down into Judea, all the way through Jerusalem. He understood what was going on, and it was not good. It was, it was very, very difficult, because what you had was a Jewish government that was actually not allowed to govern itself, and so they grasped at wealth and power and control in every way they could, trying to maintain the integrity and the dignity of their religion, their faith, their life, their people. But all the while, they were actually being governed by the Romans. Between the Roman government and the Jewish leadership, the Jewish people were caught in a vice that was crushing them. Jesus very, very deliberately dropped down out of Galilee into Jerusalem so that he could intentionally poke the bear. You know, cause trouble. Let's, let's do this and see what happens. So I want to explore with you. As Jesus dropped down on a Galilee, he dropped down into Jericho. This would have been the last leg of the trip heading up from Jericho into Jerusalem. And as he was down in Jerusalem, he walked through. There were crowds of people because he had a reputation. People knew who he was and what he could do. They knew his voice. They knew what he was about. So he walked through Jericho. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus was the tax collector of the tax collector. It, it, in, the, in the version of scripture that I read today, it said that he was a ruler among tax collectors. You know, I don't know what we would call him today, regional director. Uh, he was a big cheese. Now, all of this, all of this, was happening long, long before Jesus got there. And when Jesus walked through, it was Zacchaeus who ran down the street, climbed up a tree, <clears throat> and said, I want to see Jesus. And Jesus stopped underneath his tree and said, well, what a coincidence, because I want to see Zacchaeus. Now stop for a moment. Do you remember what the other gospel lesson was today? It was when Jesus was now already in Jerusalem, and he was being confronted by, I would call them spies, who were sent from the Jewish leadership in order to trick him. And so, Jesus, tell us, is it lawful to pay taxes or not? And Jesus took the coin and said, whose picture? So give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God. In that little parable, Jesus gives us two options. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. But I want to use that as a lens. What if Zacchaeus had that saying? He would add a third option. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. And better yet, give it all to me. That was his job. See, as as a tax collector, if, when he started as a young tax collector, he was boots on the ground out in the communities trying to find the people who owed the Roman government the taxes. And what the government of, the, of Rome said was, you get us our taxes, and if you get anything over that, you get to keep it. Th this is why they were hated so much. This, this is, was, was the problem, the greed. Oh. Zacchaeus did not see the people as human. 
But that was all right because the people inside of his territory didn't see him as human either. Can you imagine the adjectives that they used? Can you imagine the cuss words that they used? How they would have ridiculed him for just his height. They would have hated him for his position. They would have detested him for his wealth. They would have resented him for the way that he spent his money inside of their communities, living in opulence while others barely were eking by. He did not see them as human. They were simply tax revenue. Give me the money. Show me the money. But they did not see him as human either. They simply saw him as hated. Yeah, so it would have been super easy for Zacchaeus to say, give to God what is God, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and better yet, just give it all to me. That's what he was about. He was no longer just a tax collector. He had been promoted up the ranks to become a supervisor of other tax collectors, which means he was skimming the skimmers. He was now getting even more money than he used to with doing little to no work to get it. Was there any, any reason why he would not have been hated? Why he would not have even been seen to be human? He was a traitor, a Jew, working for the Romans, cleaning everybody's clocks out. <sighs> when Jesus was headed down on this final journey, what was his destination? We could say Jerusalem because that's the city that, where he was headed, but that was not his destination. Jesus was going down to Jerusalem to poke the bear in order to achieve his final destination, the kingdom of God. What he was doing was going down to provoke the Roman government, to provoke the Jewish leadership in order to help them see each other in a real light and to bring the kingdom of God down. If he could provoke, maybe he could invoke God coming into that time and into that presence. You know what? When he was with Zacchaeus, he was poking the bear then. What was he doing? He was provoking a specific employee of the Roman government, a high-level part of the Roman government, while at the same time he was provoking this man who was a Jew. Simultaneously, Jesus was poking both bears, a Roman and a Jew. Jesus, why don't you come to my house? And Jesus said, well, I was so hoping you'd ask. And so they went. In those days, you had to be extremely careful who you were eating with. Eating was seen as a very intimate exercise. For Jesus to go to the home of a tax collector, let's just insert the word sinner, extreme sinner, People would have been very confused about this. I thought you were on our side. But what Jesus was doing was to carry our side into it. He was, was wanting to carry into that the very living presence of God to provoke. And, and, and that's what happened. He succeeded in provoking Zacchaeus to really look into his own life and to examine who was he and, and what was it like to, to be him. And Lord, Lord, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, I'll repay them four times as much. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. What was Jesus doing? Poking the bear. And not just one, two. 
poking both the Roman bear and the Jewish bear at the same time. This is why he came down out of Galilee. He came down specifically to provoke an uprising for God. And he did this very, very specifically during the Passover festival, a festival that was just monstrous. They say over a million people would gather on an annual basis in and around Jerusalem. I can't even imagine. Imagine what that looked like. And in the middle of it was Jesus. And what did Jesus do? From that moment with Zacchaeus, he went up the hill, bought an eight-hour walk, and went to Jerusalem. What did he do when he went into Jerusalem inside of that week? Now, it must have been horrendous. It must have been awful because it provoked his assassination. Now, mind you, there had been those within the Jewish leadership who wouldn't have minded his assassination at any point in the last two, the year, two years before that. But now, Jesus really crossed the line. Let me put a couple stories in, in perspective for you then. It was on Sunday that Jesus came into Jerusalem. How did he do that? You know the story. He rode on a donkey, and the people took the leaves, the fronds of the palms, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus entered as a humble man riding on a donkey. What was happening? Now remember, Jesus was there to poke the bear. He was there to provoke. At the very same time that Jesus was riding a donkey into one gate, on the other side of the city, the Roman legion was marching in the gate there, led by leaders on stallions, with the blaring of horns and the sound of drums in full parade uniform, the Roman legion came into Jerusalem. Why did they do this? They did this every year because Jerusalem was a powder keg. The Jews did not want to be ruled by the, by the Romans, and they were ready for an uprising time and time again. And the Romans came in that gate to say, go ahead, make my day. I dare you. In full strength on one side of town, countered by a lone Jewish peasant on the other, what was Jesus doing? Very intentionally poking the bear. He wanted people to know that there was another way to do it. He took on the Roman Empire in that moment. All right, now, flash forward with me three days. On Wednesday, he goes into the temple, this incredibly packed temple, busy, busy, beyond busy. And what does he do? He goes into the business center. He makes a whip out of ropes. And he begins turning the tables upside down and driving the animals away. What was he doing? He was poking the bear. But this time it wasn't the Roman bear. It was the Jewish bear. And in the book of Jeremiah it says, Why are you making my house? a store. He was confronting the Jewish leadership, causing chaos and disruption. This is what Jesus was about. In that week, in that final week, Jesus dropped down. He came down intentionally to provoke the current powers in order to invoke the power of God. Man, amazing, amazing. So now, as we look at this, can you see that one of the things that Jesus was trying to do was to help people see humanity? When he was with Zacchaeus, when he was with the people of, of Jericho, what he was saying was, you are human and you are loved by God. 
when he came to confront the Romans, what he was trying to say was, will you see the people? See the people as real people. When he was confronting the Jewish, he was saying, will you see the people as real people? Can you see humans? Can you see humanity? And when Jesus saw humanity and when he invited others into the kingdom of God, that's what we're talking about, into the kingdom of God, then humanity meant inclusion. Inhumanity meant exclusion. Humanity meant inclusion. And all of a sudden, people began to see in different ways. Zacchaeus had his eyes opened. He saw the people that he had been stealing from as people, as humans, the very gift of humanity that God had given. And when he began giving his money back to them, he treated them as human. This is what Jesus was saying, is in the love of God, treat people as God created them to be. Treat people in love. Or How, how then do you and I face this? How do we deal with this? Zacchaeus was invited into the kingdom of God. We are invited into the kingdom of God. Zacchaeus was invited to, to include people, to live with humanity in inclusion. We are invited to live and, in, and see people in inclusion. Yeah, yeah. I love the story in South Africa as apartheid bore down on the weight of the people, the South African government began to clamp down tighter and tighter in the 60s, then the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s. The tighter they became, the more original and creative people became in, in confronting that. And so one of the moments happened in a, in a church where Desmond Tutu was preaching. The South African government had outlawed gatherings of people outside, but church gatherings were still qualified as legal. As Tutu was preaching on this day, to a full house, the back doors opened, and into that sanctuary came fully armed South African policemen. They lined the back, they came down the sides, they lined the sides, they lined the front, and surrounded the congregation. And what... What did Desmond Tutu do? He started laughing. And, and he said to the officers, do you know how many years I have been wanting to preach with you, to share worship with you? And here you are. Welcome to the winning side. <laughs> and he laughed as Tutu does. Welcome to the winning side. Tutu always saw the other side as humans. He always saw them as children of God. He always saw them as humanity that needed to be included, not excluded, not attacked, not rejected. No, included. Whenever we kick down, whenever we dehumanize others, whenever we reach out and think others to be inferior or not worthy or not deserving, we're falling into the trap that the Romans fell into. We're falling into the trap that the Jewish leadership fell into. We're falling into the trap. When we kick down and we see the Mexican immigrants who are fixing our roofs after a hailstorm. When we kick down and refuse to see those who are transgender struggling to find their full humanity. When we kick down and we saw the Jews being persecuted in World War II, 
and now see how they persecute the Palestinians. When we see those Republicans, those Democrats, those Independents, those Green, when we see those who are in a different political party than we are in and how we think of them and treat them, when we meet immigrants who are new to our country and are coming from places that we don't agree with, when we stand by and see women not treated equally, how is it that we fall into the same trap that the Romans fell into, the same trap that the Jewish leadership fell into, the same trap? It's all the same trap. When we dehumanize, what we are in fact saying is, give to God what is God, and give to Caesar what is Caesar's, or better yet, why don't you just give it all to me? Yeah, I'll just have what I want. And God says, no, there's a better way to live. There's a better way to love. Yeah, there's a better way. So my friends, what I want to do is invite you into a, a time and a place and a way of living that says we too can live invited into the kingdom of God. This is the power and the presence. May it be this week that you live knowing that you've been invited to the kingdom of God. Amen. I want to thank you for being here today. And now I want to simply give you a blessing. As we part, I hope to see you again next week. Receive this blessing. May you go as a people who have been named by God and claimed by God so that you can live the love of God. Lifting people up, lifting God up, giving to Caesar what is Caesar's, giving to God what is God's, and giving your whole self to God. Go in the name of God, our Creator, Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Holy Spirit, our Guide, and as you go, may it always be in God's peace.